Um, my name is Kate Broussard. I'm a senior security analyst at Bishop Fox. I represent the entire Ohio branch of Bishop Fox. Um, so I work remotely in Columbus. Uh, today we're going to do um, a basic introduction to privilege escalation in Linux-based systems. Um, so this is, I commit through web app, web, web development, web app testing, and when I first got into servers, when I finally made it through the applications, I had no idea what to do, particularly in Linux. So this talk starts basically from that point um, and goes through uh, basic privilege escalation paths once you're in the server system. Um, it's fairly intermediate level, um, so that's what we're going to do. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, that's me, that's my contact. Uh, I've been... Uh, I've been with Bishop Fox for about four months. Before that, I ran um, a consulting firm on my own uh, while I got myself all trained up. I'm a self-taught pen tester. I have degrees in literature, not computer science, but it's the same kind of systems analysis. Instead of analyzing words, I now analyze technical systems. Um, today's outline, I'm going to do a definition and framing for the talk. Um, I'll go through easy mode, sneaky mode, boss mode. Those are the three kinds of paths that I've organized. Um, and then summary and the list of resources at the end, including slide deck and a practice VM that I built for this talk, which has um, known paths built into it, except I can't promise the kernel, because I don't really do kernels. So, I'm gonna begin. Uh, privilege escalation definition. Um, it was tricky to find a single one, but I like to think of it as basically using the privileges of various agents to gain access to resources. So you're hopping through users or through services to get access to more and more things, higher levels of privilege, so that you can accomplish your goal frequently. That's going to be popping a root shell. It's the most fun. Um, privilege escalation can happen in a variety of systems, um, but comes into play basically once you are ready to take ownership. Um, and today's talk is specifically focused on once you are inside the web server, now you want to um, get persistence and escalate your privileges. So the framing that we're going to use today is looking at who is doing the execution and what are their privileges. So there are basically two ways to escalate. In one situation, you're the agent, the current user that you've taken control of. Their permissions are sufficient to execute command and do what you want to do. The second path is where something else is the agent. You can get a service or a program or another user to execute the command under their permissions, which are the ones sufficient to do what you want to do. So we're going to come back to this uh, repeatedly today, talking about when your user is the agent and when you're getting something else to do the agent for you. Um, in web app testing, a good analogy for the something else is um, like a cross-site request for you, where you get a user to take an action for you and execute a payload under their permissions. Um, you're not the one doing the command. You set up all the dominoes, but you get them to execute for you. Same kind of situation. Easy mode. Um, we're going to basically start from when you hop into the web server. We're going to look at the privileges and permissions you have. We're going to talk about sudo. We're going to look for leaked information and reuse credentials. All of these are using your current permissions. You're the agent for everything in easy mode. So when I hop into a server, this thing, the first thing I want to do is check uh, who I am and where I am and whether I have everything that I need already. So if you come in through um, a reverse shell through a web application, you probably have a web user or a www data user, and you're probably in the web route. If you've compromised SSH credentials and gotten yourself directly into the server that way, you're that user and you're probably in their home directory. So, who am I and ID are the Linux commands that will give you username, ID, and group configurations. PWD will tell you your current working directory. Those are good places to start to figure out who you are, where you are, and where you want to go next. I always double check if I have everything that I need at the beginning because I have many times spent two hours trying to find a privilege escalation path for something I already have ownership over. So, uh, you can cat out the Etsy shadow file to try to get password hashes. If you have access to that, you are an elevated user. If you have access to the root directory, you're already an elevated user. So these are shortcuts that I use to see what I can see already. What are my privilege sets at the beginning? I use that instead of checking my actual permissions. 
Um, Etsy Shadow versus Etsy Password. Passwords don't really contain passwords anymore. Shadow has the password caches or sometimes. Okay. So the next thing I do is check permissions. What do I have read access to? Where do I have write access? Um, looking to see what other users can I read in the home directory. So in this instance, level three user is 777, right? We have full read and write access to their directory. That may give us additional information. We may be able to put our own uh, RSA key in there and log in as that user. We're gonna check and see what all is in the user share. Um, I typed it into less so it's easier to read, but we're gonna try to um, list out all the, the programs that are there, all the utilities that are in user share um, and see what their permissions look like. This is a good thing also to start looking and seeing what's there, what, what custom files can you start seeing, what sorts of executables exist, who owns them, um, who gets to execute them. And we're gonna look at the environment variable, um, which I didn't like capped. Environment variables are configurations for that user on that particular system. So it'll tell you um, where they get to start, what the working directory is, um, some of their sort of permission configurations. It'll tell you what their path is set to. Um, but again, this is more details about the user you have, information about the system you're working with, um, places you can start looking for information. I'm gonna check for write access in particular places, um, any .ssh directories, uh, anything in the root, and I'm gonna see if I can write to Crontab just in case. Um, so this user in the demo um, doesn't have permission to do a lot of things yet. I get denied. That's fine. We'll work with it. We did get to read front app. There we go. So those are some of the cron functions that run. We'll come back to those later. Um, but these are just the places that I check initially when I get into a system. What can I do with the user I have? The next thing I like to check is sudo. Um, super user do something. sudo l will tell us what commands and pseudo permissions we have. What can we execute? Do we need a password? Um, so, it also tells us, so in this instance, sudo l OS boxes needed a password. Um, I did know it, so I was able to see what the sudo permissions are. Um, and sudo had, OS boxes has all, right? So I can sudo any program as root with this user as long as I know the password. So the way it works, permission denied, sudo the command or sudo bang bang to repeat the previous command as a sudo command. And with the password entered, already in this session, we get the output of the SSH shadow file. Um, the Etsy sudoers file is the permissions for all the users. Um, it'll tell you what programs they can run and under what permissions. And then Etsy group, I also like to check at this point, um, it's usually not locked to a sudo command, but it will tell you the groups that are operating and the users that are part of those groups. Um, hopping through group permissions is a nice way to escalate privileges without needing to compromise necessarily an individual user. Um, if you share groups with users, you can sometimes uh, read or execute files based on those group permissions. If I skip over something or you can't read it, just, just let me know. Um, so this is our first exploit of the day. The OS boxes user in this instance has no password pseudo permissions for Python. Language compilers that are misconfigured or interpreters that are misconfigured with pseudo permissions can execute shells because you pseudo Python when you run it. Whatever Python runs, runs under root permissions as well. So our example here, we're gonna write a Python statement to import a library use a spawn function to um, spawn a new shell, and that shell, because we sudoed Python, runs under root permissions and we have a root shell. Super simple. Well done. Good. So again, this is, we're, um, we're using the permissions of the sudo user to execute the command. Um, I also like to check pretty early on for credential reuse. Um, password reuse, as everyone knows, is rampant. There isn't usually a sysadmin sitting over your shoulder telling you to make a new password. So if you've compromised any of the web application passwords, if you have compromised a password for a specific user of your system, 
Um, if you know that you are targeting a particular admin, you have their email, you can see if they have known compromised passwords out there in all the big databases. Um, there are also common and default passwords for different services that might be on your server. Um, any of those might help you escalate privileges as well. Um, especially if there are uh, vulnerable <coughs> services, like you can get a shell escape through MySQL, you want to know the MySQL password. Maybe you already have it. Maybe it's in some other thing that you've compromised. So I like to check for credentials for any services that I run into. Um, I also like to check bash history for the current user and any of the users that I can read. Um, bash history, of course, is all of the commands entered into the terminals for that user. Um, bash history is updated at the end of every session. Uh, bash history is recorded for all the users. History is just going to be the live output for your current user session. Um, so if you do something and you want to remember what it is, you can check history, but the bash history is a static file. Um, yeah, there may be things entered into the history that are useful. It will probably point you in the direction of custom uh, executables that exist on the system that that user has run. Um, and if you can see it for other users, likewise, it'll give you some more information about where to go next. Check the logs at this point for additional leaked information. Um, are there credentials in logs? Again, useful information about what's running on this system, who has access to it, when does it run, what information does that executable need to function correctly. Um, those are logged. There are also log exploits um, for misconfigured systems. Uh, Apache has known ones. Uh, MySQL had a known one for a while where you could um, rewrite with a sim link the target of the log output and put it in a place that you could control. Um, so logs can sometimes themselves lead to information disclosures or escalations, um, but they also are documentation of what's in the system and what information uh, you have access to. So do easy mode real fast, because the other ones are a little more complex. Is everyone with me so far? Easy mode is figure out where you are, what you can do, check to see what you need in order to start moving forward. Um, do you need additional permissions for sudo or for other services? What information is just available in the various uh, logs and uh, information? Again, our two paths to escalation. We're the agent for the majority of these. Something else is the agent going through. So sneaky mode is my favorite. It's mostly SUID bits, uh, shell escapes, command option arguments, and we're going to talk about wildcards at the end. So SUID bits uh, set UID bit. For Linux permissions, you usually have read, write, and execute. The X for execute can be replaced by an S. This means that instead of the current user executing the executable under their permissions, anyone who can execute it does so under root permissions. So instead of making it world executable, such that anyone uses their own permissions, you set a, uh, an SUID bit or a group ID bit, um, and that lets anyone execute it as the privileged user, frequently root. These are great because a lot of executables in Linux require root permissions to run. And if you want, the sysadmin wants other people to be able to run that program, um, they'll set an SUID bit, and we, as attackers, can exploit that. <coughs> so, how do we find the list of SUID and uh, GUID or SGID binaries? These are equivalent, and these are equivalent. So we're going to do find statements to look for um, a user that has an S or a group that has an S. The 4,000 and 2,000 are just the octo limits for those. We're going to look for file types, and we're going to send all the errors to an L directory. That will output the list of um, suit and GUID executables. So the example just goes through that a bunch. Um, here's our list. What I like to do is get a fresh install of Linux when I was first started and figure out what comes standard so that I didn't get bogged down in a bunch of standard utilities that were not exploitable. So that's my recommendation for people who are not familiar with um, sort of standard SUID utilities, what always sort of runs with a SUID bit but might not be exploitable. Ping is a classic one. You can't really do a lot of exploits with ping, but it always runs as root, um, always SUIDed. So, you know, you can get excited about it, but it might not be the best place to start um, your exploits. So, exploitable, uh, 
sewage programs. For standard utilities, we're going to try shell escapes, frequently or command option arguments. Um, if you find custom executables or scripts, we're going to try to reset the path locally, and we're going to watch out for wildcards. So there's another statement up here that is going to try to do a combined search, and we're going to add an option argument here to list out the permissions for all of them so we can check in one statement um, for all the information that I want going forward. So we're going to grab all of the SUID files, um, which isn't really all of SUID, it just gives us the user ones. But here we can see the permissions, and there's our happy S. We're going to run it again for group, and we'll see that same S under the group executable. They are running as root. Uh, one has a group. It's a couple of groups that are different. Um, here we've got the group root, uh, but they're owned by a different user. Yeah, getting familiar with what's typically going to be on a system that's not necessarily exploitable will help you sort of focus in on where you want to really target your efforts. Shell escapes are some of my favorite things. I laughed for an hour when I first learned about them. So shell escapes are intentional functionality built into a program to execute commands within. Uh, they are frequently uh, a bang command uh, or a bang hash command. And so this is the MySQL example. We're going to figure out which MySQL we're using. We're going to look at its permissions. We're going to confirm that it is, in fact, um, suited. We're going to log in. We're going to do the shell escape, and we have ourselves a root shell. Um, because MySQL is running as root. Now, you may say, but Kate, you logged in as root. Yeah, I ran it again. That didn't matter. It's the suet on MySQL that mattered. Um, it's because MySQL itself is running as root. Uh, whatever it executes from within the program will also run as root. So shell escapes or misconfigured executables <coughs> are a really easy path for privilege escalation. Um, they're getting locked down less and more in this particular Linux version that I was demoing. Um, did not work. They gave me shells for the user I had. Um, Vim, Emacs, uh, a lot of programs have shell escapes. Um, they're super useful, but they're also easily compromised if the underlying program is itself configured. Command option arguments are similar. Um, it's another way to execute commands on the results um, for find an op, for example, on the results of a statement. <clears throat> so we've actually already done this. When we were looking for suet files, we ran dash exec to ls-ald all of our results. What that does is for everything that find pulls back, it executes um, the list command on each result. Okay. So here we get the full permissions of our find statement. Well, if we execute a different statement, say, open a new shell, then find, which is suited, will execute bin bash, or bin sh perhaps on this one, um, for every result. <coughs> it will do that under its permissions, and since find is running as root, what it opens is a root shell for us. So this is another intentional functionality. These are designed to accept additional commands and do additional operations, but through misconfiguration and misuse, we can exploit these to get root shells. Everyone good? Clear? Awesome. So we're going to do an example. Um, it is a kind of shell escape. I ran into this recently. It was real fun. So Nano is a text editor, frequently found uh, for people who don't like Vim or Emacs. Um, so we're going to check the permissions on Nano, and we do see there's a symlink, so we're going to check the, the bin Nano, and it is in fact suited. Um, it can run as root in this system. So Nano lets you load a custom spell check file, so that when you are checking the spelling of a particular document, it uses your defined list of, of spelling corrections. Well, what we're going to do is substitute that with our own temp file that contains uh, an execute shell command. We're going to make it that file itself, that temp file executable, and then we're going to load it up in nano as the spell check file for a random file that we want to edit. So we're going to make temp file, exec shell, make it executable, load it with the dash s or spell uh, option argument, and then within nano, control t is how you open the spell check file. When we do that, nano, suited, executes our temporary file, opens a shell, and it's a root shell. Right, so this is another kind of shell escape. We've loaded a custom file. We control that file so we can have it run any command we want. And the program, Nano, 
executes it under its permissions, which in this case are root. So there's another way to, um, there's another situation where you're going to set up the dominoes. The path environment variable that we talked about um, tells the underlying operating system, Linux, where to look for the execute so that you don't have to specify the full path. You can say ls instead of bin ls every time you want to list out the permissions of a file or directory. So a uh, classic use case is where you want to prank your admin. Um, in our scenario, Bill uh, wants to prank his admin. His supervisor, Sue, has her path starting with dot. Dot is the relative location. So her path environment variable says, look where you are, current directory first, for the executable, then look in these other places. So he writes a script, he names it ls, and sticks it in his home directory. He calls up Sue and says, hey Sue, ls isn't working in my home directory. What's going on? Sue goes into the server, into Bill's home directory, and tries to run ls. Her path is set to local. So what Linux finds is Bill's ls file first and executes it, because that's what she's told it to do. It executes his script instead of the bin ls binary. You can see where we're going with this. So I hop onto a web server, and I find a custom program. Um, you're probably not going to know what the other users have the path environment set to, so this is one you can run yourself. I find um, a custom script on the server that executes a call to an alias program. Um, it's going to call cat file instead of in cat bar. Or I can see that a, a program is running um, the PS command to output some information about the currently running processes. If what it calls runs under root privileges, you can, if that script runs under root privileges, you can exploit it. Right? So here's our use case. We have a helper sh file. It's a custom script on the web server that makes life easy for an admin. Right? It's got a suid bit. There's a command within the script that uh, executes something recognizable. We recognize it, say, haha, I can run this exploit. In a writable directory, we make a new file, we rewrite our path, and then we execute the script. This is going to go through. So we're going to find the suited programs. Um, it's going to pull up helper script. Right, top one, user share helper sh. That's not a standard utility, so that pings my radar right away. So what is this? What is this helper script? I run it to see what it does. Well, first I check permissions. So I'm going to see the permissions. Is this something that might be execute, uh, might be exploitable? It's got a suit bit. It's owned by root. I definitely am interested in this. So now I run it. See what it does. I recognize this. Right? It's running PS. So somewhere in that file is the command is executing the ps command. Right? It's confirmed by running it myself. I hope that they've just used the alias, right? It's not perfectly defined. So I'm going to try this exploit. I'm going to go into temp, world writable. I'm going to see what all's there. I'm going to make a new file. And I'm going to name that file ps. Well, here, I'll check the path. My path is not set to dot yet. Now I will make a new file. And I'm going to put a bin sh, right? I'm going to open a shell as the content of that file. I'm going to make it executable. I'll rewrite my path. So there's the permissions. It's an executable file. It's owned by me. I'm going to rewrite my path to include the relative alias at the beginning. Um, put a little dot. I'll export path. I'll confirm that it does, in fact, uh, contain the dot at the beginning. Cool. So anything I run, Linux will look in my current location first. So now I'm going to execute that helper script. Helper script is suited. It's going to, as root, look for the ps command. It'll find my local copy first and execute the contents within it, which in this case is opening a new shell. So it can be difficult um, in the wild to uh, determine what those custom scripts are executing. Um, they're frequently compiled, so not readable. But uh, if you get familiar with sort of basic commands, it can be sometimes uh, particularly in a CTF environment, um, it's usually pretty obvious what it's doing. 
Um, and so you can try to exploit it. Wild cards are super powerful. Wild cards can be exploited. So this is one of the coolest things that I've learned in the last couple of years. Um, when using a star wild card, the shell interprets dash file name as a command option argument. The command option arguments, again, things you submit to the utility to give it parameters. We did it with uh, find when we submitted the exec uh, command. So if you, <laughs> if you name your file dash something, it will submit command options uh, when, it run, when you run into a wildcard process. So here's an example. Uh, we have a directory. In that given directory, we have a reference file. And we've made a new file. And we've named dash dash reference file ref php. So dash dash reference is a command option for our ch own executable. It says, take this file that we've specified in the reference option, take all of its permissions, and apply it to um, every file when we're, we're rewriting all the files in the directory. So initially we say, you know, root has this, this continuous process or cron job that says, rewrite the ownership of all the files, all the PHP files in this directory is nobody, nobody. When it comes to our reference file that we've added to that directory, the reference file becomes an option and says, ignore this, use the permissions of this file. If that file reference has the permissions that we need, uh, in order to escalate privileges, that statement will rewrite all the ownership of the files to our reference file because we made a command option argument as a file. Um, so it's going to map the, the permissions onto every file in the directory because it interprets the file name as an option. Is that clear for people? Okay. This is another example of how that works. I don't recommend doing it unless you're willing to delete your file system, but here we've named our file dash rf slash star. Okay? So when we get remove star, when it gets to the dash rf slash star file, the command becomes rm dash rf slash star, which will recursively remove your entire file system. Because rm is interpreting through the wildcard the file name as an option. It's not recognizing it as a file, it only interprets it as a command option, and so it executes it. So wildcards um, are a great thing to look out for in custom scripts or cron jobs, or um, if you know that you can do certain executables with options, try to see if you have the permissions in the directories where they run to manipulate the process itself, that wildcard process, um, to do actions unintentionally. Questions about that? So that's our sneaky mode. Mostly sue and give it bits. Shell escapes, command option arguments, path equals dot, and wild cards. Again, are two ways of escalating. Sneaky mode is entirely getting something else to do the work for you. Right? We are using the permissions of the executable that is suited to take action for us. We want those suited permissions. Okay, with me so far? Cool. Last bit, boss mode is cron and kernel. Um, cron jobs are executed, or commands executed on a schedule. They are almost always run under root permissions. Um, two things to look for when you're starting to look in the um, cron area is for cron.allow, cron.deny, those specify user privileges. If they don't exist, you probably don't have to worry about your specific user being blocked. Um, what cron does, it takes a file, file tells it what to execute when that file is usually cron tapped. <coughs> um, there are also cron directories that will run at certain configurable times, um, hourly, weekly, monthly, um, and you can often write just a script in there if you have permission, um, and it'll get executed automatically. At and batch are also uh, one-time execution that work a lot like cron, but they are not periodic. Uh, so cron is typically what we want to exploit. Three ways to exploit cron. You're gonna actually overwrite the it's a cron tab file, you can. Um, you're going to look for a privilege misconfiguration on a cron directory so that you can add your own script to run periodically. Um, and if neither of those are open to you, you're going to try to look and see something downstream that's vulnerable in a cron process. So you're going to uh, see what cron is running, follow it down to the actual script that it's trying to execute periodically, and see if you can manipulate that somehow. Got some examples. First one is just over it as a cron tab. You're going to look at the permissions on cron tab. They should be uh, should be root, right? So I'm going to list out the etsy 
just for cron. We've got uh, cron D, those are various directories, cron tab file, and it is owned by root. Root is the only thing that can write to it. I'm going to cat it out to read it, see what it looks like. Here are our sort of periodic scripts. They run as root. These are the commands that are executed. So I'm going to just nano it, see if I can edit that file. Sometimes the permissions aren't what you think they are. So nano itself is suited in this system. So it can open a file that is owned by root. So even though Etsy cron tab is owned and only writable by root, I have access to it. Um, this is one of those things uh, where you can't always believe the permissions that you see. So this is just a bunch of optional commands um, to prove that I can, in fact, edit this file and make updates to cron tab. So always check. Um, there are hidden permissions in various layers. Second one we're going to look for is, um, can we write to a cron directory? So we're going to do the, the listing out of all the cron things again. We notice that cron.hourly is writable by its group, right? And its group is not root. So do we share group permissions with that group? We do! Is this an example? Right, so here, we, <laughs> we share test group permissions. Our current user has permission to update that directory. So uh, we're going to go in and look what's in that directory. Um, we're going to make our new file. And we do, in fact, have permission in this scenario to create new directories or new files within the hourly directory. That means that they will, whatever's in that test file script, will automatically execute every hour as specified in the Yep. Yeah, so run parts hourly every, seven, every 17 minutes. That's rude. So anything that we put in there is going to get executed. Third, um, we're going to look for something downstream that's vulnerable. So it's a little more complex. So in our cron D, in this example, there's a clean trash script. Clean trash definition cron job. So we're going to look at it. What does it say? Well, every 30 minutes, root executes these scripts. So I'm going to go and look at those scripts. What do they do? Are they vulnerable? Do they have other processes that I could attack? So I'm going to list out all the clean, clean trash files. It turns out one of them is writable. Right, clean trash level three uh, is misconfigured. So I'm going to make sure that I can update it. Just to check, yep, there we go. I can modify this file. And what it does right now is it just empties the trash periodically. But that's not important because we can write to it, which means we can also <coughs> write it. So we're going to write our own shell script, get a root shell, compile it, modify its permissions. And then we're going to have that cron job that we can edit modify its permissions so that we can run it as root. So our get root.c is just going to uh, execute bin bash. Right. We're going to compile it with GCC. Uh, we now have a get root executable. We're going to modify its permissions so that it will execute, uh, which in this process already happened. So it's owned by us. Here's our get root executable. It is executable, but it's owned by OS boxes. That's not going to help me much, because when it runs right now, it will execute a shell under my permissions. I want to execute a shell under root permissions. So I'm going to add an ownership change to my get root executable, and I'm going to sewage my get root executable and I'm going to stick these commands into that vulnerable cron job that I have write permission to. So I'm going to echo those into my clean trash level three script. And then when cron, so this is the process, cron is going to execute clean trash level three every hour. Clean trash level three now says change the ownership of the get root executable to root and give it a suit bit. So I waited 30 minutes. And the cron job executed. Now I'm going to check the permissions on my get root script again. And now the permissions have been updated. Right? It has a sewed bit and it's owned by root. So now when I execute that get root, it should open a shell. So I 
run it, and I have a shell. It worked. <coughs> it's just under the wrong permissions. This particular system had different ways of interpreting bin bash versus bin shell, and I got caught in it. Right? So <clears throat> I made a new one <laughs> called root me that just says bin sh. <laughs> I did the same process. I waited 30 minutes. I got a sticky bit. It's owned by root. Now when I execute root me, <clears throat> it opens the shell correctly. So I left this in because this is part of why this is a boss mode. Right? Not only are we four levels deep in our attack, but anytime you are trying to write a custom file and you pilot and get it to do a thing, there's probably debugging involved, which is not for novice Linux users. Uh, but this is the process, right? If you can't overwrite the contact file, if you can't write to a directory, look and see if there's something vulnerable downstream. Maybe there's a custom script that's misconfigured. Maybe there's a, a group overlap that you can exploit. Maybe it call, maybe that, that clean trash level three cats out a file and you can do the path dot exploit on that file that it's running. There, there are options for combining things, but that's why this is sort of later in the process. But that's the theory behind it, right? We're going to target something downstream. We're going to get a root process to execute our commands and give ourselves elevated privileges. Kernel exploits is the last thing for the day. Wow, this went fast today. This is great. Um, I hope you like debugging and see. So kernel exploits is basically a magic bullet theory. What if you just compromise the server itself? Forget about permissions. Forget about users. Forget about executables. What if we target the underlying structure? Um, the upside is, for common kernel and OS combinations, there are lots of exploits out there. If it's vulnerable, somebody's probably written a script that will exploit it for you. The downside is, there are probably lots of scripts that you will have to compile and debug, um, which is clearly not my favorite thing in the world. So, um, ExploitDB has a lot of them for known vulnerable uh, kernels. Um, you run a not small risk of breaking the server, and the, the really big deal for these is that you're going to have to debug why it doesn't work initially. Um, each of the servers that you're going to see, everything you run into, has custom configurations. Nobody's running things just out of the box. So a lot of the kernel exploits depend on a certain configuration of permissions and, ex and executables and where things are located. And so when you start trying to do a kernel exploit, <coughs> Um, you're going to have to figure out the difference between the environment you're attacking and what the exploit expects. And that's going to be a lot of debugging of where is it looking for this file? Can I modify that? Um, can I rewrite the kernel or can, the, the exploit or can I sort of move something on the web server? So, magic bullet, but it's not as simple as Google. Uh, those are the commands lsb release dash a and union dash a that'll give you your. Um, OS version and your kernel version. That's what you search for when you're looking for uh, an already written exploit. Cool. So the VM that I, I built for you guys um, does not, it theoretically has a kernel exploit, but I didn't run it. Um, so you're welcome to try that. But all of the other things that you've seen today, um, all the SUA exploits, the kernel jobs, um, misconfiguration of directory permissions, they all exist, so if you want to practice, there's one that I made for this talk specifically. Um, there are also a bunch on the web. So boss mode, our cron jobs, again, we're going to try to attack cron tab, a writable cron directory, we're going to try to affect something downstream, and um, my last resort is kernel exploits, just because it involves so much time of trying to get the exploit to work on a particular thing. Um, there are things like dirty cow that are supposed to be basically a, a nuclear attack, um, but you also sometimes blow stuff up that you don't want to. Two ways to escalate again, where you are the agent or something else is the agent. Boss mode, something else is the agent. Uh, most of the kernel exploits are going to look a lot like the complex cron job exploit, where you're, the, the kernel exploit that's written is manipulating known processes and utilities, exploiting common permissions that are likely to be in place in order to give you um, something you can, you can exploit. Mostly something else is the agent here, but you're probably going to set up a lot more dominoes in these exploits than previous. That's that. So, in summary, the goal within a web server, once you've made it through the superficial layer, you're going to want persistence, you're going to want to be able to hop back in at will, and you're going to want to escalate privileges. Um, our framework was thinking about who's the agent. If it's you, drop yourself into a shell and give yourself persistence. You know, you have what you need. If something else is the agent, you need that intermediate step. You're going to find a utility 
or uh, a process that's going to help you execute a root shell and give yourself persistence. Those are our easy, sneaky, and boss modes, various things we've talked about today. Again, Linux tends to be fairly consistent. I mean, it's, it's a super widespread platform. All the various versions are fairly consistent in where things live, um, where to look for particular utilities, what utilities come standard. So if you get more familiar with the Linux environment, um, it gets a lot faster to determine what paths are open to you in this particular instance. Resources and my contact information again. Slide deck's up uh, with PDF versions of all the exploits. Um, there's a practice VM there. It's about a gig. Um, it's a lightweight Ubuntu, um, ready to go. And then these are resources either that I used in developing the talk or things like um, the Payatu link at the top is a pretty good guide on privilege escalation has similar explanations. Um, but what I really love about that one is at the bottom there's about 15 virtual machines, um, well have mostly, and uh, they've defined what exploits are represented in each one. So if you really want to practice kernel exploits or you really want to look at sewage bits for a while, you can pull out individual virtual machines that will use those exploits. Um, so it's super useful. And that's that. We have uh, about 15 minutes for questions. Things you want to go over again? I talk really fast. I know a real cool room. Um, anything else you guys have for me, I'm available. Thanks very much for coming out.